Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf and welcome to my podcast. Each week I focus on topics related to mental health and discuss ways to help you deal with issues like anxiety, depression, shame, guilt, PTSD and more. I've spent the last 30 years researching the mind-brain connection and mental health. I worked with patients who suffered from traumatic brain injuries, struggled with anxiety, battled with learning issues, and often worked with families to resolve major relationship and communication problems. In this podcast, you will hear the advice I gave to my patients and the techniques I developed and used to help them find healing. My goal is to give you simple, effective and practical tips and tools to help you take back control over your mental, emotional and physical health. Before I begin today's discussion, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has supported this podcast, either by leaving a review, spreading the word, sharing episodes with friends and family and posting about this podcast on social media. I love reading your reviews and learning how I can make this podcast even more helpful. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in once again to my podcast. I have been getting so much positive feedback from all of you through email, at conferences and on social media. I am so happy to hear how these episodes have helped you. I also really appreciate you sharing the word with friends and family, leaving reviews and subscribing. Today's episode is one I'm really excited about. We are going to be discussing how a cup of tea a day can keep the anxiety away. Specifically, we are going to discuss how and why tea can boost your mental and brain health, which types of tea to drink, how many cups to drink to get all the benefits, and so much more. In the studio with me today, to help with this discussion, I have Simon Cheng, the CEO of Peak Tea, my favorite tea company. So, get a cup of tea and settle down because this episode is packed with such important and interesting information. You won't want to miss a second. Welcome, Simon. It's so great having you join us today to discuss how tea, specifically peak tea, can help detox the body and boost mental health and physical health. Now, I love tea, and I've always been a big advocate of the health benefits of tea, and I've been drinking peak tea for a while now and absolutely love it. So I'm very excited to have the CEO of Peak Tea on this podcast. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Caroline. It's a huge pleasure to be here, and I'm very excited to um, to chat with you and, and your audience. Thank you. That's great. Well, Simon, why don't we start with you just introducing yourself? You have a great bio, your company, your mission, how you got Peak Tea started, and what got you interested in tea in the first place? Absolutely. So I grew up in Hong Kong, um, which has very much been in the news recently. Um, but one reason that it's actually very well known um, is because it has the longest rates of longevity in the world for females um, for several years running. There's a very strong tea culture there, as well as the use of many herbal plants in the daily diet. So anywhere from soups to tonics to teas is literally integrated into everything that we eat. Uh, and I moved to the U.S. when I was in my teens. I went to Harvard for college. Um, very soon after I moved, I got very involved in the rat race of life where I thought that I had to do all of the right things and check all the boxes and obsessively build my resume. I joined the financial industry after uh, graduating from school. I spent about eight years in, in the kind of hedge fund and investment industries. And during those years, I really had a, it really took a serious toll on my life. I was drinking $3 espressos a day, um, really burning the candle at both ends. And so every year I was getting different sorts of respiratory infections, either in the nose, the throat or the chest. Um, every year I would go see the doctors and get prescribed antibiotics and uh, never thinking that there was anything underlying that was wrong with my lifestyle or what I was doing. Um, eventually both my lungs collapsed, so I had to get operations in both lungs. Uh, I have staples in both my lungs now. And then um, nothing really struck me as being out of out of the ordinary because 
I was told those those diseases were um, were hereditary and, and genetic. There was spontaneous pneumothorax. And then I went about my ways doing doing everything the same, um, eating poorly, you know, paying zero attention to to my lifestyle, my 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 energy levels. And then when I turned 30, I was enrolled in um, in Stanford for my master's degree. And uh, the doctors there told me that I had sleep apnea, which is a, a sleeping. And they recommended a surgery, which uh, they touted at the time as being, you know, having a very high rate of success of being very straightforward. And that I was so young that, you know, the last thing I would want to do is kind of live with a, a sleeping aid, a CPAP machine, it's, you know, very convinced by this, um, by this argument, which they had no doubt honed um, on many people. The surgery was a complete failure. I, my sleep apnea score was worse afterwards. And furthermore, I had to get a, um, I got a jawbone infection in, in because they had cut a hole in my jawbone where, and then that piece of bone, they, they pulled it out where it was connected to my tongue and then held it in place with a screw. And, and none of which I had, I had known about that I had any knowledge about prior to going into the surgery, by the way. And so I had to be on two months of intravenous antibiotics to cure that infection, broad spectrum going into a catheter um, inserted in my arm, going into my heart valve because it would, the, the antibiotics were so powerful, it would have dissolved a normal vein. Uh, that was the explanation I was giving. And so, you know, at the ripe age of 30, you know, supposedly at my peak of health, I was hooked up to a uh, to an IV drip twice a day for, you know, collected four hours. That's how I spent the, the summer in between my master's program, not working as other people do, but hooked up to a drip for a surgery that was completely unnecessary and was actually detrimental in all sorts of ways. You know, this, there was so much scar tissue was created from the surgery, my sleep acting was actually worse after. And so that was, you know, the, the hugest wake up call to me about, about, you know, medicine, about, um, you know, the do taking doctor's recommendations, um, following medical advice, and, and really kind of, you know, the, the idea of pursuing health, you know, conquering disease um, as and when it arises by visiting the doctor is just all of those things came into question for me. And, you know, the, the, the whole concept of, of prevention was not as, as high in, in kind of the public consciousness as it is today. And hopefully we can spread the good word about it. But that really, you know, that wake up call was the worst thing and the best thing that ever happened to me. And that uh, really became the inspiration for me to go on this this path of exploration, you know, kind of applying all my energy and my my focus towards understanding what truly, you know, led to good health. Um, I delved into traditional Chinese medicine, um, saw a lot of different experts and specialists literally all over the world. I, I traveled around seeking them out, studying under them, being healed by them. I, I delved into Qigong meditation, Tai Chi developed a system called medicinal breath work, uh, which I practice and teach now. Um, and obviously, Peak was born out of this this journey. Um, I discovered the the immense power of plants and how if we use them, or rather, I should say rediscovered, because they were very much part of my upbringing in Hong Kong. But I, I, I realized that, you know, using these, these plants in everyday diet, in everyday kind of, you know, hydration had tremendous effects on, on health and uh, you know, that's how we came about this concept of tea crystals. So we found a way to extract all of the active compounds in, in plants of any kind into a crystal form. And so instead of having to brew your plants, whether it's a tea or it's a ginger or it's a mushroom, um, you can just take our crystals and dissolve it in cold or hot water in, in seconds and make a beverage that is, you know, better on three counts. It's more concentrated because we use a specialized cold temperature extraction process that preserves a very high level of the polyphenols that are in plants or the antioxidants and other active compounds. The second is that it's much more pure. So we triple toxin screen all of our products for heavy metals, toxic mold, and um, and pesticides. So we do this on multiple levels, on the raw materials, on the finished products. We use third-party labs that are based in Switzerland, the best in the world. And then finally, the ease is is a huge benefit for a lot of people that um, have health regimes or have you know taken up health regimes and given them up. You will you will inherently understand that um, you know the convenience of whatever it is that you are you are adopting is is critically important. And so you know making it very easy to brew these plants to you know kind of experience their benefits is, is kind of core to the peak experience. So that's in a nutshell. That is amazing. What a story. And I mean, what a, a true story about the dangers of just taking any kind of medical advice or any kind of advice and to really how important it is you've stressed just you, you had to take your own health in your hands. And 
you know, going just it's fantastic. Well, my, my question was how PT is different from other tea brands, but you've explained that, you know, all this is leading to massive health benefits. So let's talk maybe rather about the health benefits associated with your teas. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I mean, the, the, the evolution of tea is an interesting one. You know, it all started off with using whole leaves, um, whole plants that were dried. Um, and then you would take those leaves or, or plants, material, whatever it is, and brew it in, in water, right? Sometimes take hours to con- to, to decoct um, these traditional herbs. And then the tea bag came along where, you know, those plants were ground up and then put in a bag. And, uh, you know, you could stick that bag in water and, you know, basically make a brew in a, in a very short amount of time. The problem with the with the advent with, of the tea bag is with all kind of, you know, industrial uh, evolution of, of the food industry is that you can't see what goes into a tea bag. And, you know, when you talk to the tea farmer and you say, hey, you know, I want some leaves for a tea bag, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, here are the ones that are suitable. And it's all the dried up, you know, broken up bits and pieces. There are twigs inside. There's old tea inside. I mean, literally, when you go to a tea farm, you're like, hey, what's the tea bag cut? It's like they, they take they take all the whole leaves out, which they sell at premium prices because, you know, people can can see, can taste, can look at and, and feel the difference. And then all the stuff that remains on the floor is what goes into the tea bags. And sometimes for Japanese green tea, you know, they will de-stem the leaf and keep the, um, the leaves for making matcha. And all the stems, which have basically like, you know, little to no nutritional value as far as we're concerned, why we drink tea, those stems are then ground up and it's like this white powder. And then that's put into tea bags mixed with some, you know, broken up bits of tea leaves. So that's, you know, unfortunately, the, the tea bag experience is like that. And, and it's influenced so much of what people perceive tea to be. And, and especially in America, um, you know, in South Africa, there's a very rich tea drinking um, a, a tradition, just as like in Europe and obviously in Asia. But in America, so many people experience three tea through the tea bag is the cheap kind of free or, or free tea bags in the hotel room. So what Peak has sought to do, and obviously there's a convenience factor, right? Like we don't want to have to brew things at different temperatures for different times, sometimes for hours. People don't have time for that. And so what Peak has done is that it's bridged the original intent of the usage of these plants for the flavor, for the health benefits with convenience. And so we have taken whole plant material um, in its kind of highest quality form. We only use tea that is harvested from the, for that is in the year that it's harvested and almost always focusing only on the spring harvest, right? There are two harvest seasons. We only use the spring harvest. Um, and then we extract it in the year of harvest and we only use whole leaves. So you're starting off with a tremendously higher quality um, raw material to begin with. So you are sorry to interrupt you. So the spring harvest is where you'll have the best quality or the best nutrient value of the leaves. Absolutely. So if you imagine the plant has been, you know, asleep for the entire winter season, the first buds that come out of the plant during the spring, those are actually the most nutritious, the most ripe, you know, the most packed with antioxidants and polyphenols and L-theanine, amino acids, enzymes, all that stuff. And then as the, as the, as the, as the seasons go on, as you get into summer, as you get into fall, that plant has experienced fatigue. And so it's going to produce less nutritious leaves. And that's why with matcha, ceremonial grade matcha is only harvested in the spring. You can't have summer autumn matcha and ceremonial grade matcha. So that's the one you know, there's a huge um, raw material um, focus that that we have. And then after that, we we extract it using these very low temperature processes. So generally, you know, sometimes cold brewing for up to eight hours, a lower temperature temperature. So heats destroy antioxidants. And so there's a way to brew things using low temperatures like cold brewing. But there's also a way to evaporate water using low temperature. And this is by combining it with pressure. So if you bring water to Mount Everest, this is getting a bit technical. But if you bring up to Mount Everest and you try to boil it, it doesn't boil, but it evaporates. It never gets, that's because of the, the, the differences in pressure. And so we're able to brew the tea at low temperature, remove the, the spent, um, you know, tea material, which is basically compost. And then after that, we remove the water through this pressurized evaporation. And you're left with what's simply the dissolvable solids that were in the plants. So it's a purely water extraction process. And it's, I would say it's, you know, the only word that I would use to describe it is, is artisanal. Um, and, and the 
way that you know you can you can tell that that there's this much integrity behind it is twofold. First, we test every single batch for um, active ingredient content. You know, when the active ingredient content is high, that means the original plant compounds are preserved. They're there in high numbers. So there's no loss. Well, there's little loss and little um, uh, destruction, right? The second thing is the, is the taste parameter. So when when the things, when the when the brews taste good as or as they're supposed to be taste, tasting, if you use whole plants, then you have also preserved the flavor compounds. So actually the flavor compounds are the same as the health compounds. L-theanine has a taste, polyphenols have a taste, caffeine have a taste. And so when you have the right taste profile, then you've also done a good job at the extraction. And, you know, we won three gold medals at the Global Tea Championships last year, being the first company in, in the history of the competition to win three gold medals in one sitting. And we only submitted three teas, by the way. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, this is just very, it's, it's very unusual. Um, and, you know, this, it's, it's a competition of all the teas from all around the world. Ladies, I need to tell you about a bra company that has changed my life, Third Love. With Third Love, I took a really quick and fun online quiz, which then matched me to the perfect bra shape and size. Every customer has 60 days to wear it, wash it, and put it to the test. If you don't love it, you can return or exchange it for free and Third Love will donate it to a woman in need. Right now, they are offering my listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash drleaf. That's thirdlove.com slash drleaf for 15% off today. Let me tell you about one of my brain boosting hacks. It's so hard to find time to sit and read and learn more, but there's an incredible app that solves this issue, Blinkist. Blinkist takes the best key takeaways, the need to know information from thousands of non-fiction books and condenses them down into just 15 minutes that you can read or listen to. Blinkist is made for busy people like you. I love using Blinkist as part of my morning brain building and detoxing routine. I recently read The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for my audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Dr. Leaf, try it free for seven days and save 25% off your new subscription. Wow, that's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then really, it's the, as you say, you know, if you're drinking a, 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 a beverage every single day, it has to be pure. You know, I don't care if it's, you know, liquid gold and it's going to, you know, be the most beneficial thing in the world. But if there, if it's not pure and there are toxins in it, even at trace amounts, it's not good for you. It, it cannot possibly be good for you to boiling a plastic tea bag in, in water at high temperature every single day. You know, it's or, or, you know, if you have trace levels of pesticides in your tea, even though if they're at acceptable USDA levels, it can't be good for you if you're drinking it three times a day or, or more. People drink 10 cups of tea a day. Um, and so even those heavy metals, the toxic mold, all of that stuff, we, we screen for it, um, you know, on a very strict basis. It's really about the convenience. This, we regard that, the, you know, our tea crystals as being kind of the, 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 the I guess, the third Third iteration um, of tea, you know, the, the kind of tea going from whole leaf to tea bag to tea crystal. Um, and I think because of our understanding of extraction processes, we're able to reproduce the original intent of tea while delivering the convenience that people seek. That's incredible. What's It's fascinating. Well, that's why, I mean, I travel with them. I love them because I've traveled all the time and they're just so convenient and they taste, it tastes amazing. So I talk, I talk a lot, Simon, about how to deal with anxiety and cope with stress. How can tea, tea, peak tea help with that, help promote calm? Yeah. So, you know, my, my new, um, you know, my new slogan, is uh, is drink tea and, and breathe. Oh, I love <laughs> it's that. It's what I've been telling people. So tea has a compound in it called L-theanine. It's an amino acid inside of tea. It's only found in tea. Now, many people may have heard of L-theanine now uh, because people are taking it in a, a supplement form. They're doing it before they work out. It's now mixed into many caffeine um, products. So there'll be, you know, like a like a like an energy drink will have L-theanine in it, and so that you can tolerate these very high doses of caffeine without getting the jitters or are becoming nervous, feeling anxiety. Um, but this is one of the wonderful things about tea is that it's actually it's actually naturally occurring, this amino acid. In fact, if you drink matcha and you taste that savory, creamy, umami flavor, 
That's actually the flavor of amino acids. It's the same amino acids that you will taste in soy sauce or Parmesan cheese or in a good tomato sauce. Um, it's also present in teas. And, and L-theanine is unique in the, in the sense that it actually has been linked to increase alpha activity in the brain. So alpha activity is the state that your brain is, is in when you're in the flow state, when you're in the kind of the gateway towards a state of meditation, you're in the alpha state. Um, and so tea is remarkable in the sense that it can actually facilitate you entering this calm state. Um, the other thing about tea is that <clears throat> the caffeine is bound to the catechins. So catechins are a type of polyphenols, which are a type of antioxidants. Um, and, and catechins and caffeine are bound together. Um, and what happens is that it's harder for your body to digest that caffeine, which is actually a good thing because it's a bigger molecule. It's a bigger compound. The caffeine only gets released as your body slowly breaks down that bigger compound. And what does that do? It creates this wonderful, long lasting time released effect of the caffeine that lasts four to six hours. So instead of drinking a shot of espresso where it hits you all at once and you kind of feel a, um, you know, a, a, a trough of energy falls soon after with tea, it's kind of a, a more longer lasting, sustainable plateaued energy. Um, and obviously that will be great for not triggering nervousness, jitters, stress, you know, cortisol production in the body. Uh, and so tea overall as an, as an energy, uh, you know, stimulant is, is extremely beneficial. Not only is it time release caffeine, it also has L-theanine, which has a, provides a calming counter effect. In fact, if you look at any monastery around the world, you know, of, of kind of Eastern in, 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 in nature, Buddhism, um, you know, Zen, Zen b b monasteries. All of them drink tea. The monks and nuns drink. And, you know, you, these are people that are meant to give up everything, have no attachment to anything. They don't care about their belongings, their clothes, their family, their their material possessions. But you know what? They drink tea throughout the day. And there's a reason for it. It's because it helps them go into this mindful state. In the same vein, uh, the meditation or the medicinal breath work that I have come to be very, very passionate and, and want to share with people. We've actually done two medicinal breath work um, challenges this year, completely for free, open to everybody, zero strings attached. We've had thousands of people attend online and uh, it's just been a phenomenal outcome with, uh, you know, very powerful experiences and and, uh, and reactions. But, you know, the breath is the other very powerful way to kind of tune down your stress response. And it all boils down to these, these the, the two very most, you know, the most natural things that you can do, but the, the two things that people never think about doing deliberately. And it, it's, it's basically inhale and exhale. I mean, it's one thing, right? But the, 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 the inhale and the exhale are two very, very different um, systems. And uh, by focusing simply on the exhale, you can actually turn on your rest and digest parasympathetic nervous system. Um, and by focusing too much on your inhale, you actually do the opposite. You actually activate your stress or flight response or your sympathetic nervous system. And you can do this very obviously by simply experiencing the sigh of relief, which is an exhale, or you can kind of huff in, in rage or in frustration, right? And so I encourage everyone to try this at home because it will help you instantly realize experientially the differences between the two. When you've gone home from a long day and you sit down on your chair and you're about to prop up your feet, most people just go, ah. And that's a that's an exhale. And when you exhale, you relax, you calm, you turn on all of the healing mechanisms in your body. When your body is in the rest and digest mode, your digestive system is optimized. Your the brachii in your lung are less constricted. Your eyes are less dilated. I mean, everything in your body, your heart rate goes down. Everything in your body that is meant to be done for healing is basically activated. Now, the opposite happens when you're about to lose it and you're super angry and someone has done something to really upset you. You start to huff and you puff and you go, <sighs> and it's all about the inhale. It's all about the inhale, right? When you're about to lift something very heavy or you're pushing something very heavy, first you take a big inhale, you go, <gasps> And then you expend the energy, right? So what that's doing is that it's shutting down all the healing mechanisms in your body so that you can have that energy to, to run for your life or to fight for your life, right? You can't do both. You can't kick back and relax and, you know, have wonderful digestion and great reproductive health and have a super calm heart rate and, and you know, great blood pressure and be in full exertion mode at the same time. You can't. So that's why your body has this split 
nervous system. Now, the, the, the breath work that I do is simply focusing on the exhale and turning that into a training process where you just keep focusing on the exhale. And every exhale you do, it's like is a deeper state of, of sighing of relief and, and relaxation. Of course, you have to focus your intent in, in certain places to help guide the energy flow and all that. But really, it's just turning on the, the parasympathetic in, in, a, in, a, in a structured way, in a, in a way of training yourself to do it. Brilliant. I totally agree with all of everything that you've said. It's something that I do as well. So it's really fantastic. So interesting that you how you've brought that into the whole tea experience as well, which is amazing. So Simon, how many cups of tea must one drink to experience the health benefits of your tea, especially when it comes to supporting healthy cognitive function, cognitive and emotional, let's say cognitive and emotional function? You know, I really don't know the answer to that, Caroline, but I can say that, you know, doctors generally, you know, there are tons and tons and studies that are done on tea. And, you know, tea is probably one of the most studied foods under the sun. In fact, it might be the most studied food out there just because it's, you know, it's the second most consumed beverage after water in the world. And you know, there have been many tea drinking demographics that have been linked with high rates of longevity and, and low rates of, you know, of, of, of discomfort and, and, and other kind of issues. You know, tea drinking in every single study that's been done, a certain amount of tea is is recommended. I mean, there's, you know, some studies will use, uh, you know, only catechins, so catechin extracts. Some, some studies will only use, you know, different, you know, Theoflavin extracts from black tea. You know, there's always a certain amount. There's a dosage. It's not, hey, you know, just randomly drink tea or, you know, take one uh, catechin supplement here and there. It, no, it's a fixed amount. And so the recommendation, and this is something that most people don't realize and, and certainly don't do, is that you actually need to drink. The recommendation is three or more cups of tea a day to experience health benefits of, of any sort at all. And so if, you know, if you're, if you're a tea drinker and uh, and you know you consider your tea yourself a tea drinker and you're and you and you drink tea and you think it's wonderful but you only drink tea when you're when you have the flu or you know once a week or you know when you when you you know don't feel like having coffee that that one day of, of you know out of four it's not really doing anything for you at all I mean it's of course it's better than nothing but if you look at the tea drinking populations in Asia in the Middle East um, in many parts of Europe they drink tea throughout the day I mean you can't go anywhere in in Hong Kong without being served a cup of tea whether it's a restaurant or a friend's home or you know in, in even an office they have actually a tea lady or a tea gentleman and, you know, that comes around with investment banks have this service that, where they come around and they fill your cup with tea, Western investment banks. And so it's very much part of the culture there. It's like it's easy to drink 10 cups of tea a day. And most people do. They drink tea instead of water. And so my grandfather, he's 104 years old. He's 105 this December, actually. And he spent his whole life just drinking tea. I, I think he, he doesn't really drink water. And so and, and that's not to mean that he's taking whole leaves and, and, you know, making a fresh cup of tea every every sip that he has. Of course not. That would be that would be a, a crazy amount of tea to drink. But, you know, many, many people traditionally in China, they will they will start off, you know, with a fresh batch of leaves, maybe three times, maybe twice a day. Day, they'll 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 re renew the, the the batch, but they'll keep adding water to it again and again and again and again. And of course, you can do that with high quality loose leaf tea. You can't do that with a tea bag, but you know some of these teas can be infused up to ten times. And by the ninth or tenth infusion, you're drinking you know maybe eighty percent water, ten percent tea, um, but you're still getting something out of that. Um, and so the answer, the long the long winded answer to your question is, you know, generally speaking, I think the researchers, including you know Harvard's public Harvard School of Public Health, has this on on one of their their new nutrition source articles is three or more cups of tea a day is the recommended amount. Okay, fantastic. Well, that's really good to know. And it's such interesting information. I know that you're launching a very special product in October known as the Fermented Pure. Uh, can you share Can you share more about this and what we can expect from it? What makes it so special? Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal plant. In fact, it is the reason, it's the very reason I became so passionate and, and kind of um, you know, fanatical about wanting to share tea with the world. So Pu'er tea is how it's pronounced, Pu'er. It's actually from a place in China called Yunnan province. So it's known as the foothills of the Himalayas because it's the, it's the province that's next to Tibet. So it's literally leading up in elevation to the Himalayas. Because of the elevation, it's the perfect, it's the perfect climate for growing tea. It's hot during the day and it's cool at night and there's always humidity in the air. So these mountains are typically enshrouded in mist and not a whole lot of rainfall. And tea is from here. So tea was first discovered in Yunnan province 5,000 years ago. Uh, this tea tree there, which I visited, anyone who purchases 
anything from Peak will get a thank you email with me and the picture of, of a 3,200-year-old tree. And that's the oldest tree in existence today. It's actually in Yunus. It's near where we, we source our, our leaves. That's why I was there. But so we're launching a tea from there that is um, that is called Pu'er tea. So all the tea from there is called Pu'er because that's one of the regions in Yunnan. And the phenomenal things about these trees is that they were all planted as seeds. And everyone's thinking, well, you know, aren't all trees planted as seeds? That's how, you know, trees grow. They, they sprout us as, as, as seeds. Well, you know, the unfortunate answer is that most of our food sources are no longer planted as seeds, particularly when it comes to, you know, food sources that come from trees. It takes almost 50 years for a tea tree to mature into a um, productive um, plant when, when it's planted as a seed. And so, you know, these seeds were just sprouting all over the place, you know, hundreds of years ago. Maybe they were planted and hundreds of years ago, but back then they weren't, they, they didn't have the agricultural technology that we do today. So they planted seeds and they just waited around. Many of the tea trees there are also just wild growing because, the, you know, they're indigenous to that area. And so the teas that we're launching were all planted as seeds. Now, what happens when you plant a seed? Many of you might have seen a bean sprout before. You have the, 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 the bean will sprout a root or sprouted nuts before. A root, a single root will come out of that, right? And that is the central root of the entire plant and the tree. And what it does is that it starts going straight down into the earth as deep as it can go before branching out. And so what you have is a root system that is very deep and stable, right? And deep is, is essential to this process. Now, the difference, and this is what will make you immediately realize the difference, is, is that most and most tea trees today, and in fact, most and most agricultural plants, the way they plant them is that they'll take a branch of a mature tree, they'll chop it off, and they'll stick it in water so that little roots grow out of it. And then once it's stable enough, they will stick that branch into um, into soil, right? And that branch thinks it's a 50-year-old or whatever decade-old um, tree immediately. So it doesn't have that central root going down. The, the roots immediately start branching sideways. Now, what happens when you take a whole bunch of these branches and you stick them all over an industrial plot, industrial agricultural plot of land, they all competing for each other in the topsoil for nutrients. And it's completely unsustainable. And so you have to feed industrial tea trees because they're totally unsustainable because they don't have central roots that go down. Whereas these original trees, these poor tea trees, they have these roots that go down. They're sucking up trace minerals. They're sucking up, you know, rare nutrients. All of this stuff from the deep earth is going to the leaves, which we're plucking and turning into tea. Whereas all of the industrial tea plants, they have to be fed because they're fed. They're so weak. There's no other organisms growing around them because they don't allow any herbs, any shrubs. Forget about any any sort of, uh, you know, weeds or anything. All of those stuff is killed. And so there's zero biodiversity in the soil. There no, there's nothing feeding that, that soil other than human created uh, plant food, right? And so of course the plants are weak, they have no immune system, so they have no defenses against insects, which means you also have to use pesticides. That's it, that's basically 98% of the tea that people are drinking out there. Arson, these tea trees that we're using in our, in our upcoming tea, they have grown completely untended by human beings. Even if you were to pour a bunch of fertilizer, it doesn't do anything because the roots are so deep and the soil is so rich, it never has an issue. It, they don't, they don't, they rarely ever get sick. They completely completely have natural defenses against the insects. And it's growing interspersed with all of the weeds, the ferns, the shrubs, the herbs, all of this stuff. They die, they decompose, they add to the biodiversity of the soil. And it's just this incredible ecology. And the, the trees are just sucking up all these nutrients, all the biodiversity in the soil, and it's just going into the leaves. And we, we pluck it during the spring and only the tips um, of, of the leaves. So the most tender, nutritious parts of the tea tree. Uh, and that's just the raw material. I mean, the second stage of, of the of the tea making is that these teas are so nutritious, they're actually not that good to drink fresh off the tree, believe it or not. The, the, the poor teas are most famous. In fact, it's the most expensive tea out there because of its ability to age. And once you can age stuff, you can have vintages and then the prices just could become astronomical, right? And because it's of its unique nutrient density of these leaves, they're able to age very effectively. So, you know, the most expensive poor teas, you can have 100-year-old poor teas out there that are sold in auction at Sotheby's and Christie's. You know, it's because of the nutrient density. But what's happening during that aging process of these leaves is something truly remarkable. And it's those microorganisms that are inside, that are indigenous to that forest, that are on those leaves, are actually causing a chemical reaction to occur. So it's like when, it, when a fresh tea leaf falls onto the ground and it decomposes and turns black. That's actually what's happening with these teas, right? And so, and so it's actually the, the microbes inside the leaves.
teams. They're eating the catechins and they're converting those catechins into black tea antioxidants called theoflavins. And theoflavins are tremendously beneficial to health. There are a lot of studies done on them. And so we're launching two teas. Uh, one is a green tea. So it's a semi-fermented version. Um, and then one is a, a, a fully fermented ripe or black um, poor tea. And so one is very rich in theoflavins, which are the very black tea antioxidants, and one is very, very rich in catechins and polyphenols. And, and you know, not only is the source of these teas remarkable, but what's happening to these teas, even in the crystal form, is remarkable because they're continuing its transformation, uh, its fermentation process, much like a kombucha is. It's a live food. And these teas are truly, uh, you know, they're they're really out of this world. It's, it's I mean, the, the closest analogy I can think of, you know, for your audience is like, you know, think of kombucha, but made with ancient tea trees, but having no sugar in them. Absolutely amazing. This is fascinating and incredible information. I know for sure that this is I for sure won't touch any other tea except peak tea and I can see why I love it so much with all the just what you said fascinating information well thank you Simon this has been so informative so interesting I'm so pleased that you took the time just to explain this because I know everyone's learned as much as I've learned today it's really been informative and you know for those of you listening you can get up to 20% off your peak tea order and free shipping when you go to peaktea.life slash Dr. Leaf. The link will also be in the show notes. Simon, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate the time and the great information. Thank you so much, Caroline, for the opportunity. I'm tremendously grateful to be able to um, to share my passion with, with you and your audience. It's been a, it's been a privilege and, um, and I'm so excited that we got to, to do this together. I'm so excited as well. And your passion is evident. You've made me very excited about tea and I think our audience as well. So thank you so much for that for a great interview. If you are interested in learning more about mental health solutions and how to help yourself and others, I want to invite you to my 2019 Mental Health Solutions Summit in Dallas, Texas, December 6 and 7. This conference is perfect for parents looking for tips and techniques to help their children, employers and managers looking for solutions to employee burnout and stress, educators looking for information on how to help students manage anxiety, life coaches looking for more practical practical and applicable mental health care resources for their clients, medical professionals looking to increase their knowledge of mental health and how to incorporate techniques into their work, and so much more. This conference is focused on providing practical, easily applicable and accessible and scalable solutions to mental health related issues. I highly recommend getting a group together and getting your tickets now before we are sold out. We will also be offering CME and CEU credits. For more information, go to drleafconference.com. The link will also be in the show notes. I hope you found today's podcast interesting and helpful. If you want more tips and help with managing anxiety, depression, and mental health, be sure to visit my website at drleaf.com and to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I also include a schedule of my speaking events and so much more. And follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look for Dr. Caroline Leaf. Also, I love seeing all your posts on social media about this podcast. I love seeing what resonates with you and what you've learned. So be sure to continue posting and tagging me and letting me know what you think and how these tips worked out for you. And don't forget, leave a review and keep spreading the word about this podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I really hope you learned something new and helpful. Till then... I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf.